A Guide to Cardiac Vasoactive Drips Part 3a Vasoconstrictors Used for Refractory Shock Hi everyone and welcome back. In part 3 of this lecture series, we will answer the question, what happens when catecholamines don't work? The alternative agents used for refractory shock, vasopressin and angiotensin II, will be discussed in depth. I will also review adjunctive agents to add on to the treatment of shock, the so-called rescue agents, and discuss their relative benefits. All of this in part three, refractory shock. Due to the extended length of this material, part three will be broken up into two sections. Part three A will cover vasoconstrictors used for refractory shock, and part three B will be a separate installment which will cover rescue agents. We left off last time talking about what other agents we can use for refractory shock besides catecholamines. And yes, we can use vasopressin and angiotensin too. Let's quickly go over the advantages of using these non-catecholamine vasopressors. In refractory shock, the alpha receptors are desensitized with repetitive exposure to catecholamines. Vasopressin and angiotensin II use pathways that are distinct and different from traditional vasoconstrictors. These agents will achieve the MAP goals and also will lower the catecholamine doses to avoid catecholamine adverse effects. Also, catecholamine vasopressors don't work very well in acidic environments, while these two non-catecholamines will work in acidic conditions. Vasopressin is an endogenous hormone synthesized in the pituitary gland. It's also known as antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Its trade name is vasostrict. Vasopressin acts on V1A, V1B, and V2 receptors, resulting in vasoconstriction and antidiuretic effects. The V1A receptor is very important in elevating arterial pressure and septic shock. The V2 receptors are located in renal tubules and when activated, result in antidiuresis, or water-retaining properties. Vasopressin will increase mean arterial pressure and will decrease the norepinephrine dose requirements in septic shock. It produces hemodynamic effects similar to phenylephrine. What's the dose that we use for septic shock? We will infuse it at a fixed rate of 0.03 units per minute, which is a low physiologic dose of vasopressin. This dose is not titratable. Higher doses above 0.04 units per minute should not be used due to cardiac and mesenteric ischemia. Vasopressin is also used for diabetes insipidus and upper GI bleed, but it's used at different doses for these indications. What kind of clinical outcomes do we see with vasopressin? This was studied in the VAST trial in 2008 when low-dose vasopressin was added to norepinephrine, vasopressin resulted in a significant reduction in norepinephrine infusion rates, as expected. However, when the 28-day mortality rates were analyzed, vasopressin did not show an improved mortality benefit over norepinephrine. Further analysis in a smaller subgroup of patients who had less severe septic shock showed that vasopressin appeared to have a slightly lower mortality than norepinephrine. So vasopressin is a safe and effective adjunctive vasopressor that can be added to norepinephrine as a second-line agent. Since it is a non-catecholamine, it offers a different distinct mechanism of action, which may be beneficial whenever there is impaired alpha-1 receptor responsiveness to catecholamines. An interesting note is that vasopressin deficiency has been found to be present in patients with septic shock. So administration of low-dose vasopressin may result in substantial increases in arterial pressure. Let's move on and talk about the second non-catecholamine vasopressor named angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is a naturally occurring peptide hormone that's involved in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or RAS. The synthetic form of angiotensin II, with the trade name Giapresa, was FDA approved in December of 2017. The FDA approved use is as a vasoconstrictor to increase blood pressure in adults with septic or other distributive shock. 
In order to understand the mechanism of action of angiotensin II, we need to completely review and understand the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or the RAS pathway. During conditions of low renal perfusion pressure, JG cells in the kidney produce renin. Renin is an enzyme that stimulates the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin I. Angiotensinogen is produced by the liver. Angiotensin I is converted to angiotensin II by the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. ACE is derived from the lung and renal endothelium. Angiotensin II then acts on angiotensin II type 1 receptors on vascular smooth muscle cell membranes, causing direct arterial vasoconstriction. Angiotensin II also stimulates the adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone and stimulates the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone, both of which increases reabsorption of water in the kidney. Of additional note, Critically ill patients may lose pulmonary endothelial angiotensin conversion, converting enzyme ACE function and thereby become deficient in angiotensin II levels. The main trial involving angiotensin II was called the ATHOS-3 study, which was published in May of 2017. In this study, angiotensin II was added to norepinephrine. The results found that patients in the angiotensin II group achieve the target MEP at a significantly higher rate than those in the placebo group. And also, patients in the angiotensin II group required less norepinephrine, the so-called catecholamine sparing effect. Unfortunately, there was no significant difference in the 28-day mortality rate with a p-value of 0.12. These overall results were very similar to the VAST study that involved vasopressin. The authors concluded that angiotensin II can effectively and safely increase MAP and decrease catecholamine requirements in patients with refractory septic shock, but has no effect on reducing mortality. As far as dose, angiotensin II infusion can be initially started at a dose of 10 to 20 nanogram per kilogram per minute, then titrated up. The half-life is less than one minute. Target MAP should be reached in five minutes. In terms of side effects, in the ATHOS-3 study, angiotensin II had a higher incidence of thromboembolic events, 13% versus 5% placebo, which included deep vein thrombosis. One drug interaction to keep in mind is that ACE inhibitors may increase the response to angiotensin II, while ARBs may reduce the response. Overall, angiotensin II can possibly be used as a third-line catecholamine-sparing vasopressor after vasopressin is used. Here is some additional product information regarding angiotensin II. Note that the cost of Giapresa is $1,500 per vial. At a rate of 20 nanogram per kilogram per minute, about one vial will be used per day. Another class of drugs that we could consider adding in refractory shock are corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are frequently utilized when vasodilatory shock is refractory to fluid resuscitation and conventional vasopressors. As far as mechanism, the beneficial role of steroids is primarily related to their ability to sensitize vascular smooth muscle to catecholamine and angiotensin II responsiveness. They also reduce inflammation-mediated vasodilation by decreasing production of nitric oxide. However, steroid therapy for the treatment of shock remains very controversial. There's clear evidence that supports improved shock reversal. However, there's conflicting evidence regarding mortality benefit. The most recent study involving corticosteroids in shock is called the APOCRIS trial, which was published in March of 2018. In this study, IV hydrocortisone plus NG fludrocortisone was given to patients for seven days. They compared that to placebo in adult septic shock patients. The findings were mostly positive. Steroids significantly decreased the 90-day all-cause mortality, which was the primary outcome. They also significantly decreased mortality at ICU discharge, hospital discharge, and at day 180. 
Steroids also reduce the number of vasopressor-free days at day 28. However, steroids did increase the rate of hyperglycemia significantly. However, they did not increase the rate of serious adverse events, gastroduodenal bleeding, or superinfections. The authors concluded that in septic shock, the 90-day all-cause mortality was lower among those who received corticosteroids than among those who received placebo. They stated that their trial results were better compared to other studies because of quicker randomization from shock onset and faster administration of steroids, where they gave bolus doses and other studies gave it by continuous infusion. So low-dose corticosteroids are recommended to be given to patients in refractory septic shock when they are not responding to norepinephrine. The recommended dosage of hydrocortisone for refractory shock is 200 to 300 milligrams per day, given as 50 milligrams IV push every six hours or 100 milligrams IV every eight hours, with or without fludrocortisone, 50 micrograms PO or NG daily for seven days. This amount is based on the amount of glucocorticoid that is similarly produced in the body during a stressful event such as surgery or trauma. Here's a complete table that reviews all of the significant aspects of the two non-catecholamine vasopressors and the corticosteroids. Let's talk about inotropes and whether or not they can be used in shock. Question, do inotropic agents have a role in shock? Answer, not in septic shock, but maybe in cardiogenic shock. Here's why. In septic shock, endotoxin and cytokine release decreases SVR, systemic vascular resistance, and decreases your blood pressure. The resulting effect is an increase in cardiac output. And as we discussed, norepinephrine and vasopressin will be used as therapy. In this case, we do not need to use an inotropic agent in septic shock because the cardiac output is already high. In cardiogenic shock, the etiology is a bad heart, and so the initial effect is a decreased cardiac output, resulting in a decrease in SVR and blood pressure. Initially, we would use norepinephrine as a first-line agent, but because of the decreased cardiac output, we may want to consider adding on an inotrope, such as dobutamine. Inotropes have very good effects and positive effects on the heart by increasing myocardial contraction and stroke volume. They also increase heart rate, and so overall they will increase cardiac output. However, inotropes do have negative effects. They can increase arrhythmias, they can increase myocardial oxygen consumption, they can cause vasodilation, which may worsen shock, and overall, they do not decrease mortality. So what's the bottom line? Inotropic therapy may be indicated if there is evidence of low cardiac output with persistent organ hyperperfusion, despite trying to restore fluid volume and achieving adequate MAP with vasopressors. Inotropes should be administered as short-term therapy, avoiding prolonged administration as much as possible, and titrated to the lowest dose. So let's review what we've discussed so far. Vasopressin and angiotensin II are vasoconstrictors that can be added to norepinephrine as second and third line agents respectively in the treatment of shock, primarily septic shock. Because they're non-catecholamines, they have a reduced incidence of tachyarrhythmias and can work in acid environments. Both agents will increase mean arterial pressure and decrease norepinephrine requirements with relatively few side effects. However, neither drug has been proven to reduce mortality in sepsis. Steroids can be added safely in refractory shock to sensitize vascular smooth muscle to improve vasopressor responsiveness. Hyperglycemia needs to be closely monitored if steroids are added. In part 3b of this four-part series on cardiac vasoactive drips, we will discuss the nitric oxide pathway and how it's involved in cardiovascular hemodynamics. We'll define what vasoplegic syndrome is, 
and review the four rescue agents used in refractory shock. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.